Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Disruptive Pedagogies panel. Um, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement. Uh, we must acknowledge that the land on which we gather is a traditional and unceded territory of the Lenape. We, the Brooklyn College community, acknowledge that academic institutions, indeed the nation and state itself, was founded upon and continues to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live and uphold their sacred relations across their land. We also pay our respect to indigenous elders past, present and future and to those who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Um, I would like now to introduce the participants in this panel. I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Lisa Lowe. Lisa Lowe is our Hess Scholar, and she's a professor in American Studies at Yale University, directing the Graduate Program in American Studies. And she's also affiliated with the Program of Win Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and Ethnicity, Race, and Migration, and teaches courses on race, colonialism, migration, and globalization. She plans to talk about the importance of conceiving the classroom as a dynamic, multi-centered, and multi-directional, uh, multi-directional when not organized around a standardized notion of excellence that can be measured simply by grades. Susan Longton is an associate professor in the Department of Communication, Arts and Sciences and Disorders. She's a licensed certified speech language pathologist who has taught graduate and undergraduate courses in the department for the past 20 years. Her research interests include autism, disability, child language, and using yoga to enhance traditional speech language therapy in adult Parkinson's patients and children. For the panel, she'll be talking about specific student-centered assignments that she developed uh, for her graduate clinical practicum course that reflect the disruptive pedagogies. Stephanie Johnson Moulton is a director of the Hitchcock Institute for Studies in American Music, as well as an associate professor of musicology and faculty in the American Studies program. Her current book project focuses on American opera and disability and on American popular song as a domestic violence narrative. And she's thrilled to be teaching disability in America, the first disability studies seminar offered at BC in spring of 22. Her talk will focus on a course in general education that she's taught for some, in some form for almost 20 years courses music appreciation. In the fall of 2020, as she redesigned her entire course for an asynchronous online format, she had the opportunity to shake up the content and build the course centered on music's cultural context and to do so with a specifically anti-racist intent. Maria Sharon Del Rio is Associate Dean of the School of Education, Professor and former Program Coordinator of the School Counseling Graduate Program at Brooklyn College. Uh, they are the recipient, they were the recipient of the Claire Tao Distinguished Teacher Award in 2017, which is the highest teaching award at Brooklyn College. Their research scholarship and advocacy focuses on ethnic and cultural minority psychology and education, including liberation pedagogy, intersectionality, multicultural competencies, LGBTQ issues, gender variance, and well-being. And finally, I am Anna Gottlieb. I'm a professor of philosophy at Brooklyn College, and I, my work focuses on bioethics, um, moral psychology, and ethics. And with that, I think I'd like to introduce Susan Longton. Hey, thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about some assignments that I developed for a course I have been teaching for the past five years. It's a clinical practicum course and a, sem and a seminar in the field of speech language pathology. So I'll tell you a little bit about the course, a little bit about the students, and then uh, at least one of the assignments. And if I have time, I'll tell you about the second assignment. So when Anna contacted me about this um, panel discussion, I wasn't really sure what disruptive pedagogies were and if I if my work would really you know fit into this panel. But as I did a little reading on the topic, I thought, yeah, this really smacks well with what I have been doing in my seminar and the kinds of assignments I have constructed for it. So the course is has really two pieces to it. It's a cl clinical practicum where students are working with actual clients 
in our campus-based speech language hearing center, which is located in Boylan Hall in room 4400. And because of the pandemic, most of the work over the past year and a half, two years, has been done via telepractice. So the clinic is just coming back into face-to-face -face work. However, everyone knows that uh, visitors are really not allowed on campus yet. So the clients in our clinic are mostly faculty and students that attend the college that wanted to uh, use our services. Um, so the, the course is required and it's part of our master's program in speech language pathology. And the program is accredited. And in fact, uh, next month we're having um, one of our a site visit for our reaccreditation, which occurs you know, every several years. So you know, our faculty are really busy with that right now. So I also want to tell you a little bit about the students. So the students that take this seminar are second year graduate students. And this particular cohort, and they are in a cohort um, always, they entered the program in the fall of, 20, of, not, of 2020, so right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so they've been involved in like an added layer of working in telepractice, which say my generation never had to learn, wasn't even available as a technology when I was trained. So the career goal for these students, and they are quite goal oriented, is to become state licensed and each state has its own licensure requirements and also nationally certified as speech language pathologists. Upon graduation, these students will work in varied settings, hospitals, acute care settings, such as rehab facilities, long-term care facilities, such as nursing homes and schools. Uh, we, they are very goal oriented. We have an ethically and racially diverse student body, but not as much as one would expect in New York City. Uh, and the profession, which reflects national trends, is predominantly female. Um, you know, they're trying to change that, but it happens very, very slowly. So while the students are in my seminar, you know, they're simultaneously engaged in real clinical experiences, having real world experiences. And that's what we draw on for the course. It's, it's really all uh, based on their experiences. And they, you know, they learn about evidence-based assessment, evidence-based intervention, because our field, like the medical field and the education field, wants all treatments to be evidence-based, you know, based on data, based on hard numbers. And over time, the students will learn to work with individuals that have speech problems or language problems or swallowing problems or communication problems. Um, and I don't mean problems, I mean differences or disorders and across the lifespan. So you know, the scope of practice is quite broad and they have to stay within their scope of practice. There's a lot of overlap, but it is different from what a school counselor would do or, or a, count, a, a counselor in psychology. Some overlap, but differences from what an occupational therapist would do and a physical therapist. But right now there's a big thrust on interprofessional collaboration. And you know, that's a good thing. Um, and our students learn culturally and linguistically approaches to intervention. They learn about counseling and all kinds of professional issues. And whatever they do, they have to focus, they have to follow the code of ethics that is in our profession, right? Including client confidentiality. So um, that's a little bit about the course, a little bit about who our students are. The two assignments in the course that reflect, you know, what is known as disruptive pedagogies, that philosophy, um, are such um, in the sense that they are student-based, they are student-led, they are student-centric. So I know in the psychology field, there's this old concept of the jug and the mug with, you know, the professor um, pours into the mug, right? She, the professor is the jug and the student is passive. So that is the you know, actual, absolute, absolute 
of what you know I'm doing in my teaching. The students are extremely active and everything they do really emerges from their clinical experience. So the first assignment, and I don't know if Anne is gonna give me the next sign before I get to the second one, is a problem-based group discussion. So in this assignment, students can choose whether they wanna work individually or in pairs. And what they do is they lead a discussion on a specific clinical question that they come up with, a topic they come up with, or some kind of a challenge that they're experiencing in their clinical practicum. What the students do is identify a reading, and that reading is to be required of all seminar participants. The reading, these are grad students now, and they're in their second year, has to be peer reviewed, and it will serve as the basis of their discussion, which they will relate to a, their clinical challenge or issue or topic. So if the students choose to work in pairs, they have to each select a reading. And so, for example, if they're working with uh, people with autism, they may choose an article on autism. If they're working in a case that has, um, has some um, you know, counseling concerns, they will work they may choose articles on counseling. So they basically choose what they wanna choose. And um, so what happens is they, they pick the reading, but I, I kind of vet them because I wanna get a variety of readings on different topics. So they each, they send email it to me and then, you know, like this term, everything got approved. Last term, everything got approved. And then it's their responsibility to upload it to Blackboard. Um, and then it's the responsibility of everyone to read the article. So every, everyone has to read it and that's a requirement. But the student who selected the article will lead the discussion. I will, you know, they, you know, we all unmute, we mute ourselves. They are leading the discussion. And then at the end, you know, they bring in the students, they have to come up with questions to ask their peers and everyone has to participate. And a big part of the course is, you know, student participation. So the guidance I give them is, you know, it's really, it's in the syllabus, of course, you know, I talk about it when I meet with them is they have to come up with, you know, what is the nature of the challenge? You know, how do they come to this topic? How was it addressed? in the article, how do they address it in their practice? What did they learn from the experience? You know, what do they still need to learn? Susan, can I cut in just like one more minute? Sure. Okay. And then, you know, how did it inform their current practice? And how might this information be shared with a novice clinician? So this is interesting because they appeared, they are paired rather with first year students. And, um, so they have to be able to communicate this information, not only to us, right? Me as the instructor, their peers of the group, but also the first year students that they are paired with. And then in terms of, you know, what they do for something writing, in writing, they fill out, instead of summarizing the article, which I really didn't like because you can, you know, they have great abstracts for all the peer reviewed articles, there's your summary. Rather, I, I developed an article analysis form that's for them to take notes, you know, take your notes on this form, use, use your notes when you present, because that's what people do in real life. Um, so because of the time constraints, I'm not gonna go into the second assignment, I will just say in that one, it's they pick a client, someone who has a story, right? I know Anna's going to talk about, you know, stories. So these or everyone they work with has a story, their background. You know, why are they here? Why did they? Why did they come for therapy? Why did they seek out services at our center? So they have to integrate information from the client's story, everything they have learned about evidence-based practice do some problem solving, clinic sharing, learn how to present it to a group, which they will be doing in real life when they're on teams, like in a hospital, right? Working with a team. For example, if you have uh, someone that had a stroke, 
right? You're only one part of a team. And um, again, they're given some guidance about what they should cover. No, she's, she's up to them. Time's up at this point. Sorry about that. Thank you. No problem. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Okay, um, so my talk will be related but slightly different. Um, as I've said, I'm a philosopher by trade and I'm specifically a philosopher that works in narrative. So this talk is related to a paper that I wrote a while ago called Beyond the Trolley Problem, Narrative Pedagogy in the Philosophy Classroom. And I start with the idea that uh, Audre Lorde um, said a lot better than I ever could. She said, the learning process is something you can incite literally incite like a riot. And as a discipline, philosophy is often considered, especially by beginning students, to be a recitation of great historical figures and their ideas, or also ritual of fascinating but abstract hypotheticals that appear to be largely removed from practical concerns. So something like this. Um, I'm going to try and share something with you now. Yes. So if you've ever seen this, this is the trolley problem. Uh, so the idea is that you're this person right here. There's a trolley coming this way. Uh, and you can make a choice whether the trolley goes this way, kills a lot of people here, or this way only kills one person. This is known as what's known as an intuition pump in philosophy, very often used in philosophy classes. Um, I have argued that this kind of trolley problem um, Philip of Foot came up with it in 1967, so it's quite old, is not really that useful. And especially when you take biomedicine, which is an area in which I teach, um, when that's added in the form of medical ethics, student expectations shift from obscure moral debates to receive lists of clearly articulated ethical principles and generalizable case studies that they think are there to decide, help them decide what to do. That doesn't really work either. This insistence on abstract rule following really detach sort of a historical rule following above all else leads, I think, neither to a fair assessment of another's point of view, nor to the idea of unbiased spectatorship. In most cases, and I think this is particularly important for this panel, what we leave out is the morally vital role of gender, racial, social, and other contextualities. And in fact, I suggest that the trolley problem should really look more like this. If you guys can read the text, you know, you're not this guy, you're this guy right here. So basically the trolley problem is very much not so, not so um, easy, not so clear, and you really never know who you are or who any of these people are. So I think the trolley problem is not that useful to ethical discussions. So I want to challenge this abstract approach to teaching and learning philosophy, especially moral philosophy, medical ethics, as intellectually and pedagogically impoverished. And I want to focus on more con contextually richer narrative pedagogies that largely borrow from feminist theory uh, to focus on the moral sensibility and intelligibility of non-ideally situated individuals. Individuals who don't live in ideal worlds where a lot of philosophical and biomedical um, hypotheticals unfortunately live. So how do I do this? Well, I do this by introducing moral dilemmas narratively. And that means really sort of sharing of examples that are lived stories, actual experiences of people in difficult moral situations, in difficult medical situations. And I do this in addition to hypotheticals or theoretical questions. And I sort of show that all of these things, all of these sources matter. And it's not just the hypotheticals and it's just not just the theory that matters. It's really the lived stories that uncover what's morally relevant, what's important, what the students should think about. And I think this encourages students to move beyond the notions of impartial moral theory and consider more nuanced and difficult questions about what might make certain stories and storytellers seem more valued and valuable. Why do we hear so many ethical examples, moral examples that feature, for example, only white men? You know, why do so many other people kind of fall out of the equation? So to remedy that, I turn to narrative pedagogy and naturalized bioethical dilemmas. And by this narrative approach, I mean a focus on the significance of context, 
of situatedness and importantly, the communication of stories, the act of communication, what Susan talked about, uh, the stories that people tell about themselves and others as they navigate the ethical universe. Because I think in a really important sense, we are the stories that we tell about ourselves and the stories that we hear others tell about us. So I want students to approach ethics from that perspective. Ethics are not rules. They're the interplay of stories. And so first, this kind of narrative pedagogy is fundamentally non-hierarchical and, and it's a lot more inclusive. It pays attention to individual situations, particularities, stories of oppression. It takes note of who in a sense is being left out of a moral dilemma, of a moral conversation. And I think this, this translates into teaching practices that pay closer attention to situated learnings, uh, situated learning, sorry. The understanding that knowledge is not this amorphous, detached, unassailable structure to memorize, but a contextual and socially constructed process that is affected by both power and voice. Our students all come from somewhere. They are situated knowers and the professors are situated knowers. And what we read, the authors of what you know, we read are situated knowers. So I think all of that has to be taken into account. So what happens is then is a dialogue between the material that we read, the instructor and the students. And what narrative pedagogy welcomes are empirical data, scientific science, stories, theories, all of it in order to put pressure on and to amend ethical ideals and neutral theoretical presuppositions. Because the idea is, I think there, there is no neutral knowledge. And especially when it comes to philosophy and to bioethics, our students ought to know that they're not learning something objective and removed from reality, but subjective and intimately a part of their lived experience. Thank you. And I think Stephanie is next. Thanks, Anna. Disruption. As much as it frustrates and interrupts, disruption breaks the rhythm of the regular and requires us to rethink, reimagine, and deconstruct. While disruption in the classroom may conjure images of flying paper and the sound of raised voices, Disruptive pedagogy implies a radical teaching method derived from activist scholars such as Bell Hooks and Judy Human. I'd like to take a moment to talk about some positive disruptions in my own field of music studies. Around the US, departments, conservatories, and schools of music are having conversations about curriculum and pedagogy in an effort to acknowledge the Eurocentric and also male-dominated origins of the field and to recognize the panoply of works by musicians and composers, both historic and contemporary, that have yet to be explored. Since well before the 1970s, many institutions of higher education, including ours and our conservatory right here at Brooklyn College, have aligned with European standards relying on Western music theory, history, ear training, and piano, combined with classical private lessons and ensembles as the core of the future musicians' training. The National Association of Schools of Music has tailored their accreditation of higher education music programs to this classical paradigm. NASM's basic curriculum has changed very little since its inception in 1924. Its only mention of American music, for instance, is in Appendix 2. Given that K through 12 arts programs, music programs in particular, have been on the New York City budget chopping block since the mid 1970s, only students with economic privilege or the sheer luck to end up in a school zone with a music program will be prepared to take college level classical auditions without private lessons funded by another source. What about those students who want to major in music but have not had access to classical training needed for these classical music auditions? The remainder of this presentation ponders the connections between curriculum, access, and American music. After the murder of George Floyd and ensuing activism at the national, local, and college level, faculty in the Conservatory of Music united to form a long overdue diversity and inclusion committee. 
brainstorming about ways to create programs for undergraduate students whose musical experience was outside of the Western art music tradition. A significant objective was to support our existing programs while broadening the department's intellectual footprint to emphasize cultural analysis of music. Another goal was to incorporate support for interdisciplinary programs such as Puerto Rican and Latino studies, Africana studies, American studies, and women's and gender studies. Finally, we wanted to make sure this program could easily accommodate transfer students, so the number of credit hours needed to be around 54. The idea emerged for a BA track that would combine critical thinking, social justice, and practical experience in American music, importantly, without an admission audition. We designed a new BA track in American music and culture that incorporated courses already offered by interdisciplinary programs and or the conservatory. We needed to be mindful of the way this track would fit into the conservatory's already delicate dance of space, schedule, and budget. As you can see in this slide, um, we collaborated extensively with American Studies incredible chair, Dr. Jocelyn Wills, so that students would not only receive their BA in music, but also an American Studies minor, ensuring they would be well-grounded in a cultural history of the US. Most of the courses here run every other semester. Um, we did, however, have to write two new courses the capstone course and the American Music Practice course, or AMP. Um, my colleague in performance, Dr. Malcolm Merriweather, co-wrote this rotating four semester course of group workshops on different topics. AMP allows students to experience performing different genres of American music without extensive previous training. A typical rotation of AMP topics would include hip hop and R&B, gospel and praise music, musical theater, and pan-Caribbean musics. But I can also imagine special topics such as indigenous musics, um, pop and rock experience, and blue and new grass. So I'm offering this as a case study, not as a one-size-fits-all solution to the complex and sometimes, sometimes troubling problem facing music programs today. But rather as one way to begin taking action towards a more just curriculum open to all students. What's unusual about American music as a place of unity in music pedagogy is that the US is not only a location of global musicking, but also a place where European art where the European art music tradition continues its long history. For faculty who have always taught in the NAS NASM curriculum or similar, it's a good time to reconsider what and how we teach to college music students. A track such as the BA in American Music and Culture may prove to be an invigorating force for change. This degree track has the potential to bring musicians who were in different practice rooms together as standmates, co-authors, and activists. So this might leave you with a question. What about incorporating these principles into other courses in the conservatory? And what about music in general education? This past summer and fall, I revised the course I've been teaching in a relatively similar way since around 2003, um, the EPIC Music Appreciation course, which at BC is Music 1300. I'd been meaning to revise this course for so long, but while I was teaching the music major section, I really needed to give my students an overview of Western classical music. But I'm not gonna lie, uh, revamping the course has been a total joy. And it all started with um, having to take the online educational resources course. <laughs> so um, I will uh, say that I had to teach the course asynchronously, which was something I'd never done before and totally terrifying. Um, but I will show you in slide seven that I started out with an ode to the series Lovecraft Country. Um, and this was what my Spotify playlist looked like over here for the old course. And you'll see it has like lots of um, Josquin and uh, Gregorian chant, Hildegard von Bingen, whom I actually love, um, Thomas Wilkes, lots of classical stuff. And then over here, this is my uh, a snippet of my playlist from the new course. Um, which started out with this amazing opera aria written by Laura Cartman. Um, and it um, has an amazing uh, poetic text. And um, the episode depicts reimagined scenes 
from the 1921 Tulsa riots. So I had an opportunity to teach about the Tulsa riots, um, introduce opera, and um, focus on the history of American black song and um, music while bringing in the concept of aria and art song and all of the other objectives I have to meet for that course. So then I couldn't help but continue on and frame the course around units on music and its intersections with gender and sexuality, music and its intersections with disability, and then music and its intersections with social class. So it was a total love fest for me um, in creating this course. And of course, each unit focused on a different um, music and media based series. So um, I hope you might engage with some of these ideas of um, being inspired by the latest and um, most incredible examples of um, media that is at our fingertips for accessing new views of history and um, creating new course materials. And um, one more thing, I created this course in Universal Design for Learning, which was a new experience, but incredible in that I, um, instead of papers, my students are able to submit video essays, podcasts, and, um, and short papers. Uh, so that they have a variety of learning styles addressed in the course. So um, thank you for listening, uh, and let's use that potential energy to disrupt for good. Thanks very much, Anna. Maria. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Maria Sharon, um, and uh, as I was mentioned before, I'm Associate Dean of the School of Education. Uh, but for uh, since 2006, I've actually been a professor uh, in the School Counseling Program, which is a master's program that seeks to train people who want to become school counselors, mostly in our uh, DOE in New York City. Um, the counseling profession uh, has a long history of uh, of vying for disruption and disruption specifically of the status quo. So when um, uh, the invitation to present here was offered to me, I was uh, delighted. Um, and uh, particularly as I could bring then my uh, approach to teaching what is uh, in the counseling program, um, infusing all classes, but also specifically in what is the multicultural counseling uh, classroom. And there is a, a long history uh, also um, in multicultural counseling, you know, to teach to precisely disrupt and disrupt the systems of oppression that, you know, keeps inequities in education and also in health and mental health in our schools. Um, my approach in particular is one that is uh, anchored in what is called uh, liberation psychology. Uh, and also in intersectionality and using a decolonial approach and um, so. In addition to teaching content uh, to our st students, you know, part of what we need to teach is for them to be able to challenge how they see the world, uh, in the in particularly as it relates to the systems uh, that you know uh, continue to enact oppression. Um, so I'm just going to quickly try to share my screen and and uh, the liberation psychology is. Um, the adaptation of what was uh, Paulo Freire's uh, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed um, into psychology. And it was um, specifically uh, a position, you know, also in the 1960s by uh, Ignacio Martin Baró um, uh, uh, from, you know, El Salvador. Um, and, you know, at its core, it seeks to disrupt the status quo, which is one that is um, Oppress, uh, oppressive, you know, to people who are marginalized and um, in, in various ways. So from this perspective, part of what I bring to the classroom and what I engage my students was in examining the dynamics and learning about the dynamics of the religion oppression and also identify how the systems of oppression are perpetuated and what our role in that is. So in addition to just learning about content, um, we need to bring ourselves into the classroom to examine ourselves. And um, as a process uh, of teaching how to do that, I will bring myself into the classroom as well. So this in itself is also the fact, you know, I am a, a queer and gender queer uh, Puerto Rican. Um, and for many of my students, I'm, you know, the first uh, uh, non-white faculty uh, that uh, is teaching them, you know, at a graduate level. And for some of them, you know, in an undergraduate as well. Um, so I bring myself into the classroom in order to help and join them into how they need to be thinking about who they are and how they're being perceived. 
And what this does is that it helps us think and locate ourselves within the dynamics of the systems of privilege and oppression as it relates to society, but also as it relates to each other. And when we think about locating ourselves, I'm not just talking about one aspect of our identity, but we consist of many different aspects of ourselves that are also tied into systems that marginalize people. So um, along, I use this framework, which is the addressing framework, and all of these areas, um, we can think about who we are and who we are in relation to others, and how do we stand in the system that favors some groups and marginalizes others. But it's not just about thinking about who we are in relation to others in each of these categories individually. Um, we also need to be thinking about how these categories also impact themselves. And this is what uh, it means to have an intersectional approach. So it's not just that, for example, I am a Puerto Rican and that's part of my ethnicity, but that I am a queer Puerto Rican, which means that, you know, not just in terms of my you know, sexual orientation, also my gender, as you know, being gender queer, how, what that looks like for me because of being Puerto Rican is different than what it would look like to someone who has a different ethnicity or a different race. Um, my privilege in some areas um, is going to impact how my oppression in others looks. Um, and this is a particularly important as it relates to how we can engage in being empathic with others. So as you might, um, you know, as, as I guess, you know, it's probably, um, uh, you know, very easy to see, you know, as counselors, we need to be able to also develop a muscle of empathy. And in order to develop the muscle of empathy, we also need to be thinking about where are the areas in which it is hard for us, you know, to be empathic. So I challenge my students to think about themselves intersectionally and to think about how, in many ways, the areas in which hold privilege are blind spots. So we need to think and we need to uh, get to know more about both um, how that oppression looks like and also what is it that we don't know uh, because we have uh, experienced that privilege. Um, and some of those blind spots can be barriers you know, to empathy. Another aspect you know, of you know, this work in which we bring ourselves and we challenge ourselves to really expand how we think about ourselves in order to also you know, develop our muscle, uh, empathy muscle, uh, is very much tied to um, also one of the approaches to liberation, which is you know, to contextualize ourselves, uh, both not in terms of our identity, but also in terms of uh, where we come from, right? And uh, this ties into Paulo Fre uh, Paul Freire's um, pedagogy of the oppressed. Um, but it also ties into what is, uh, you know, the colonizing perspective. Uh, so for many of us, um, we come and we have backgrounds in which, you know, we have uh, 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 suffered from the impact of colonization um, in both, you know, our places, the places of origin and also the places in which our families of origin may have been, uh, but also here in the United States. So as we bring about and we rethink history, not just in terms of, you know, uh, the uh, settler history, but also in terms of, you know, indigenous uh, history and also indigenous epistemologies, uh, again, we begin to fill in gaps into our knowledge that um, we otherwise would not necessarily have. So how, how do we do this? And how is it that, um, pausing the share. So how do we go about in doing this? Um, well, I engage the students in various experiential exercises. So uh, it could be that we, you know, uh, attend a panel together, that we watch, you know, a clip together, um, that, you know, in pre-COVID area, you know, we would actually uh, collaborate and bring um, artists who either would, you know, do uh, monologues or be part of, you know, um, plays. Um, and we share an experience together and an experience that um, shows us a different reality from what, you know, we are used to. Um, and in that process, you know, we uh, seek to uh, rethink how we are relating to, you know, the, this topic. We think how we are really relating as our emotions are also um, uh, present. Because this, you know, in order for us to be able to disrupt you know, and it all, uh, we need to connect in different ways. And in order to be able to challenge ourselves to connect, um, we have to also be open to having in our classroom emotions that can sometimes be uncomfortable, uh, but also at different times that will, you know, help 
uh, uh, spark solidarity. Um, so, you know, in that process, you know, um, we experienced things together. There was time uh, also for students, you know, to uh, reflect on their own and have, you know, personal uh, assignments and interactions uh, with me, you know, giving feedback. There was a, a whole groups, you know, uh, discussions. We also um, engage in thinking about um, uh, how uh, meditation and how also mindfulness could also help us be more present, you know, as, you know, this happened. And ultimately, you know, the, the, the main piece would be to engage again in empathy that brings solidarity and solidarity uh, in order to uh, bring about liberation for everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And last but not least, uh, Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, this is wonderful to be a part of this discussion. And um, thank you again to uh, Rosamond, Anthony, and all of you who have made this visit possible. Though I am recently and currently teaching at Yale, I taught for 25 years in the University of California, San Diego, um, a public university. And I'm deeply committed to public education and appreciate the special place that Brooklyn College is. Um, my subject matter is that I teach courses on race, colonialism, capitalism, immigration, anti-colonial and anti-imperial traditions. Uh, and um, so I imagine that the, what I teach contributes to disrupting pedagogy by departing from the standard curriculum and to teach traditions of thought that are not normally taught um, and particularly those that have been critical of the existing social order and also have been parts of struggles to change it. But in the very brief comments I'll make for this discussion, I want to address not the what I teach, but the how we approach the classroom question. Um, I consider the classroom as a dynamic, multi-centered, multivalent social space, uneven in knowledge, experience, preparation, ability, expression, and all kinds of other ways. In other words, our classrooms are incredibly unequal, precisely because of the profoundly unequal society that they mediate and of which they are a part. So if we take as a given that there's not a unity of talents, abilities, and learning styles, but actually many kinds of knowledge, book-centered and experience-centered, expressed and unexpressed. Um, I loved Stephanie's presentation about music because of course you don't need to uh, be thinking as much about language and accessibility of language. Um, so if we take as a given this profound inequality, then as teachers, we don't just change what we teach, but we need to change the ways we teach them. Um, of course, we'll teach new materials. We'll always be reading and adding new authors, adding new uh, ways of teaching. I'm somebody who started teaching before there was PowerPoint. <laughs> so, um, or before, I mean, I wrote, I, you know, when we didn't write on computers, but we wrote on typewriters. <laughs> Um, so, uh, of course, we need to update ourselves and be willing to learn new areas and new media, um, which is not, it's not just a, a sort of funny matter. It's also about the, the ways in which our students have different kinds of literacies and think in other ways and express in other ways. So uh, if part of our um, responsibility is to make the classroom uh, open to multiple forms of preparation and expression, then we need to be literate in as many ways as we can be literate. Um, so, uh, so what I try to do is think about the classroom as a porous and open and collaborative multi-centered space. Um, and um, not as of course, I don't of course think of it as unidirectional imparting the knowledge of the active teacher to the passive student but as this dynamic set of exchanges among different kinds of uh, located, situated, um, learned people. Um, so if we're alert to a range of different contributions, we're also aware that access to learning is differentiated by many factors, race, class, gender, learning ability, language accessibility, and so forth. Um, and we need to hold space for these factors 
even if they're not always visible or available to us as instructors. Um, in other words, it's not our role to try to decipher what the inequalities are or to make people testify to them, um, but rather to design a space in which we can hold all of them there. Um, and uh, so interactive exercises, student initiated topics and materials, collaborative projects, collective work, improvised discussions, a lot of ungraded work. Uh, I wanna talk about two experiences that have really um, influenced me and, and changed how I've taught. One of them is teaching incarcerated students and the other one is teaching in COVID. Um, one of the things I tried to do is as much of the time as I could is not grade and make a part of the classroom. I know this is not always possible in all of the different topics that we teach, but if the, uh, if the course is not oriented around grading, if it's not oriented around an abstract notion or a standardized notion of achievement that pits students in competition against one of an another, it can be more dynamically multi-centered. And I've tried to um, support that dynamic environment. As I just said, um, uh, recently I taught incarcerated students uh, through the Yale Prison Education Initiative. And this really deepened my sense of commitment to this approach. Um, when we teach in um, incarcerated settings, it's impossible to know the details of our student circumstances, the reasons that they're incarcerated, what their sentences are, how long they've been there, how long they will be there. And, uh, and so we're, you don't even speculate about it. Um, and the, I learned so much in this teaching in this uh, classroom, I was dazzled by the students' engagements with the material, not because of some knowledge I had about who they were, or some standardized idea of what everyone must learn and how they conform to it or how they demonstrated that they had learned it. But because they spoke eloquently with references and in languages that I often haven't heard in the university classroom outside. The quality of the attention of the incarcerated students was very different. I found it as very different than that of the traditional classroom. And I learned so much um, from that experience that I now bring to other teaching that I do. Um, I mean, I don't know how to distill exactly what that is. I mean, aside from being tremendously moved by how serious and how brilliant the students are. Uh, but it, it, I suppose it's that the, the, the understanding that so much is out of you and that we have to listen and learn uncustomary languages of engagement. Um, in a sense, teaching incarcerated students is only a more explicit and more dramatic version of what we experience in our other classrooms. Um, and of course, it just emphasized to me how students possess a wealth of knowledge and experience, and it's our job to create the classroom as a space in which they're able to share it with others. We, of course, don't have a monopoly on knowledge. Knowledge comes in many forms, and it's very precious when students bring what they already know to bear on the discussions and the materials. So this can happen better when we create a classroom that's dynamic, multi-centered, multi-directional, and especially not organized around a normative notion of excellence or achievement that can be measured by grades. So the other condition that really has change the way I teach is this nearly two years of COVID uh, when many of us have been teaching on Zoom. Um, I, at my university, we're actually teaching in person now, but, um, but we still do so much of our, our work on Zoom, office hours and so forth. Um, and as we know, st students come to the, the Zoom from a variety of backgrounds uh, just as they come to the classroom with a, from a variety of backgrounds, and even less is visible on the Zoom screen. Um, so the inequalities and range of resource and preparation for what we're doing in the class um, is even less visible and accessible to us. So 
uh, rather than trying to see or discriminate if students are struggling or how they're struggling or where they're struggling from, um, I've tried instead, of course, I've invited people to tell me if they can't make an assignment or, or do something, but I've instead tried to widen the breadth of acceptable participation and to permit a variety of participation. And as I said, to do away with as much grading as possible to teach from where the student begins, not on a curve that compares one with another, and to be willing, most of all, to alter the syllabus and assignments in conversation with the students over time, so that it's a dialogical, processual experience. Um, and I don't know necessarily where it's gonna go. And I invite them to bring materials in and to teach the class themselves with some of those materials. And, um, you know, I know that that sounds maybe to some of you that sounds a little bit uh, disruptive, <laughs> um, but I think um, I've learned a lot in doing it and um, it was a way to make it through this COVID period um, that was unex that had unexpected um, treasures in it. So um, I suppose one further thing. Um, in presuming that the classroom mediates many of the contradictions or all of the contradictions and inequalities that exist in the larger society, um, we understand that, that one of the primary ways in which it does that is in terms uh, of social differences expressed through race. But of course, race isn't biologically determined or phenotypically read. It's rather a way of understanding classifications of social difference specific to regional and historical contexts and always implicated with other valences of social difference and power, gender, economic class, religion, ability, nationality. Um, and these shift and change and are not accessible to us through, through sight in the classroom. Um, race always intersects with other kinds of social difference. But at the same time, race doesn't explain all of the many kinds of social difference that exist in the classroom. There are also unevennesses of accessibility, capacity, pace, style of learning, listening. Um, and some of these converge with racial and social differences, but some of them don't. And so we can't, we can't always, I guess what I'm trying to say is we can't always know and prescribe what those unevennesses are. We just have to know that they're there. Um, that they're complicated and not easily deciphered. And if possible, we need to make room for these differences, even if they're hidden by the structure of the classroom, or even if they're hidden by the students themselves. So our roles aren't to decide what the exact contours of those differences are, but to allow them to be there and to make room for them. Um, again, one of the ways and one of the most important ways to do this is to replace the dominant meritocratic understanding of excellence as the individual's attainment in competition with one another. Um, as we continuously interrogate what equity means, we also need to interrogate what excellence means. Thank you. Okay, I think now we're probably ready for questions. Okay, so first question from Michael for Professor Lowe and any of the other panelists. Much of my introductory class on the foundations of education for undergraduate pre-service teachers centers around the root guiding question, what is the purpose of education? How would you answer this? It's a great question. I'm not sure I know how to answer that. Um, as, as someone who doesn't teach education and um, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to sound kind of um, abstract or uh, touchy feely about this, but I, you know, I think that the purpose of education is to, to think differently than we thought before. Um, you know, I know that many people would say that it's vocational, that it's about um, social mobility, um, that it's about accreditation, and um, I, I don't want to deny those kinds of, of realities and necessities. Um, but the purpose of education is learning, and learning isn't 
learning a standard canon, but thinking for oneself, thinking critically, um, being able to read one's location and one's circumstance. Um, I'd like to. I guess Maria, maybe. Oh, uh, Maria. Um, I I would agree. I guess you know, for me, the purpose of education is to facilitate learning within a context, right? And the, and and of course, you know, my approach is you know similar to uh, Thetis is you know that that learning needs you know uh, to transform, right? And and once you learn something that is new to you, you know, you are a different person. Um, and, you know, that learning also should serve people, you know, to, um, uh, you know, for, you know, towards the liberation, you know, towards their advancement and personally and not necessarily in terms of um, monetary, not necessarily as a way to become part of a larger machine. Uh, but you know, to be able to think critically about their lives as well and what they want to do with the information and the knowledge that they have. Um, I actually had a similar question asked me by a student a little while ago, and I guess my response to it, and this is not an answer to what is education about, but I think one of the reasons education might be for is to imagine ourselves otherwise. It's to sort of allow ourselves to think about what life is like if things hadn't turned out a particular way. I think in, in philosophy, especially, I like to sort of get my students to think about what if the facts didn't line up in a particular way? What if you weren't born where and when and to the sorts of people you were born? What if you were born in a different culture? Would your answer to a particular dilemma be different? So I think in, in some ways, it's sort of, you know, education is there for that kind of imagination that I think hopefully could breed, could spark empathy. Um, yeah, Stephanie? I, I think Maria phrased it perfectly. I think we, we educate ourselves so that we can broaden our thinking and learn to listen better, become more empathetic and um, spark change. Mm -hmm. Susan? Yeah, uh, simply put, to open one's mind, you know, which I think encompasses everything that um, my fellow panelists have said, to really open uh, open up one to different thinking, different views, different perspectives. Very important. Um, we have a question from Lauren. Lauren asks, does disruptive pedagogy look different in a first year student survey class than it might in a capstone seminar? Sure. Does does it look different in a private university than in a public university or are its principles ultimately universal one size fits all? <laughs> no. Yeah. To anybody? Anyone at all. Right. Well, you know, it can, uh, Lauren, it, it can't be one size fits all, right? We have, I know we always think of our students developmentally, you know, just in our graduate program, the first year students for, and the second year students, they're in very different places. They've had such different experiences and they bring such different backgrounds to the learning, you know, learning environment. And certainly, you know, a, a freshman, a, you know, first year student survey students versus someone that is in, you know, in, in a later, later along the line, the all term, you know, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, you know, I haven't heard those terms in ages. Um, but yeah, it can't be the same, can't be one size fits all. You know, Lauren, I love this question because I think about the first thing that occurred to me was I, I have the great pleasure of teaching the very first course in the music history sequence and occasionally getting to teach the very last course in their sequence. And I save their assignment, their very, their day one, you know, little blurb that's like not graded and I just hoard it in case I have them again. And then I give it back to them, the last course that I have. And, and I love to see them look at how they've evolved and, and utilize that experience of evaluating themselves and redefining themselves and, and exploring how they've become different people over the last two or three years. And, and I think that as they 
recognize how they've evolved, they can help us understand how they want to be taught and how they how they want to learn. And it's I think it has to be a kind of mutual experience in that way. And I, I think that's a beautiful question because it, it is so dynamic in that sense. I, I would probably say that, you know, it, it's it's always, you know, what is meant to be disrupted is going to be different. So, you know, the disruption, you know, is going to, you know, um, uh, certainly be different. And even, even with the same set of students, many of us um, have students who are kind of like cohorts. So we see them, you know, from beginning to end and we see them individually grow. And some of us actually see them grow as a group. Um, and you know, um, each each time you know, I had a different cohort. You know, my classes were slightly different because the challenges, you know, that what needed to be challenged also was different. And you know, um, I haven't been teaching in the last, you know, now for the pandemic because I'm doing an administrative uh, job. But you know, the my class and my approach to what I was teaching um, uh, evolved and had to shift drastically after uh, the murder of Trayvon Martin. And you know later on, you know the murder, the murders of Eric Garner, um, and George Floyd, you know, and you know, you know all the, uh, you know, black men and women, and also you know trans, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, disabled also, you know, uh, black and brown bodies that you know have been documented over over these years. So, um, so I think that that is those of us the commitment to disruption needs to be reevaluated. You yes. know, depending on what needs to be uh, what's necessary at that point. Anybody else want to take it? Nope. Okay. Uh, moving on. So Rosamond asks, I'm curious about how you might respond to colleagues who think that telling stories, narrative pedagogy, or eliminating auditions or allowing students to teach is lowering standards. I really like that question. Okay, I'll take it. Um, so yeah, I've actually heard that um, the practice of quote unquote telling stories in class is somehow lowering the standards. The students aren't learning, you know, the principles, the methods of philosophy. In my experience, they learn them better because the methods will come back, the the principles will come back, the theory will come back, but it'll be understood in context. You know, in a sense, you have to meet your students where they are. You can't force them into this alien territory and start hammering top-down principles of them. That's not education. That's called being a drill sergeant, you know. So I think I think it actually is, you know, if, if you're talking about outcomes, it's not lowering standards if what you want is a student who feels at home in the subject area which I think is also another way to look at education, is you make what you're teaching feel home, feel like home to your students. It's not alien territory. So so yeah, so I think um, people who say it's learning standards are quite honestly, just, it's like, they're just wrong. <laughs> I, I wanna address the issue of the um, auditions. Um, I think uh, there are two ways to look at it. The one way is um, apples and oranges. If students are auditioning for a conservatory music, um, bachelor of music degree, not a BA, that, that's something different entirely. So they are really going for uh, a different degree program. Um, and, and that has a different focus. Um, and the other argument about lowering standards, um, these students are, are going to do a lot of work in their program and um, it might be um, it might be intellectual work rather than uh, time spent in the practice room. So that that's a different type of work and the standards of the kind of critical thinking that they're going to be doing could be compared to the intellectual work that the other students might be spending in the practice room. Mm -hmm. And I just want to quickly mention that, you know, those arguments are often used um, uh, within the context also of, a, you know, very, you know, Western uh, white approach, you know, to learning, you know, because, you know, the, uh, you know, 
education for everyone, opportunity for everyone, whether you know it's in, in you know in music, in art, you know the ability to develop, you know, um, in a communal way, and you know telling of stories. That if there's if there's a tried and true method of having people learn something uh, that is you know uh, has been cross culturally validated, you know, through millennia, it's actually you know narratives and telling stories. Uh, so it is, it, is, it is important to also, you know, challenge those notions are uh, very Eurocentric and Westernized um, that are devaluing uh, indigenous epistemologies all, are, all around uh, the world. I'm really glad you said that because one of the um, units I introduced in my course was uh, uh, virtuosities, uh, retelling virtuosities, and it was about redefining what virtuosity is in a cross-cultural sense. And uh, that didn't have anything to do with, with Western virtuosity. And I think that's exactly what we're going for is, is redefining what virtuosity means. So I'm really glad you said that. And it's something, yeah, not upholding the standards of, of white supremacy. Thanks, Maria. Um, so why don't we do this? Oh, we have a lot of really great questions and rapidly diminishing time. So why don't the presenters look, you guys all see the chat? Everybody can see the chat. Pick a question that you like and answer it in whichever order. And I think Alexander's question is next, but whichever question appeals to you, um, you can just begin answering it. Why am I not seeing questions? I'm sorry? No, no. Okay. Lisa, do you see one that you like? Um, well, I'll answer James's. Hi, James. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think this goes along with the, with Rosamond's wonderful question and Maria's answer as well, which is, um, you know, grades are probably one of the most reductive ways of measuring anything. You know, they're not, uh, they don't, they're sort of generic in, in the most reductive sense. Whereas storytelling or translating um, values, ideas, histories into other languages would be would maximize um, the range of uh, human learning. So, I mean, if there's a way to tell people at Fordham, I think you're at Fordham, uh, to to not think, to not believe that that grades can actually tell this long, more elaborate um, and differentiated story. That it's not a matter of inflation. I mean, it's it's a way of grades are a way of um, reproducing hierarchy and elitism. That's that's. I mean, it's it's not really about learning. Uh, I know that it's a it's a shorthand for um, measuring learning. I mean that's what it's set up to do, but but when you think about it, it really is about um, about maintaining um, individualism, elitism, and hierarchy. I don't know if you would say that to an administrator, but <laughs> maybe I'm not answering this well. <laughs> but Marie is an administrator, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, you know, that, um, you know, I don't know if it's part of just, you know, my, my actually my Puerto Rican background that is still as a colony, you know, and uh, with everything, it's still, you know, very much uh, regimented by someone outside that we don't necessarily agree with, you know, you find ways of resistance and just trying to get around uh, things, you know, while, um, you know, making them work for you in a way that, that that matters. Um, so I think that you know we definitely need to to rethink how we grade. Um, uh, we need to rethink classes whether they should some of them be graded or not because we do have pass no pass courses, right? Um, although that is still a grade, right? Um, but it definitely brings I think uh, the centers the attention of people who are you know um, you know the centers I think you know that that the 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 elitism of you know the A versus the B versus etc. Um, so you know I think there's there's still ways to work within a system that can be disruptive even if they're not necessarily the revolutionary. Um, 
you know, grading also based on process, right? And a lot of us talked about content and, you know, just making sure that the content is understood um, and content is important, but also, you know, are you grading, you know, the uh, also effort for students and effort not as a way of um, also lowering standards, but, you know, of also seeing and, and grading for growth. Um, we struggled a lot, you know, also with that grading piece. And I, in the same way that, you know, I think, you know, Alex, um, you know, Alex is, um, question about you know the uh credentialing and training all these aspects of education you know um and um i think that it is that part of the challenge for for some of us can be you know how can we disrupt what it is uh while we cannot escape it right again this is again what i think the puerto rican part is so in terms of uh training Right, and particularly you know, as it relates to students who are underrepresented in our profession, how can we make our programs uh, make sure that they actually do succeed? Because it's not just it, it will be just not just about their own um, uh, uh, individual or family advancement, but also you know um, uh, how that's going to impact the profession you know as well and make it easier for other people who you know who look like them and who come from places uh, you know and, and from groups that are marginalized. Um, so, you know, I think there's, for those of us that choose to work still within an institution, and all of us are doing that in a greater extent or other, right? We have chosen to continue to work within an institution that is oppressive, that is racist, that is sexist. Um, I think the challenge is, you know, um, uh, you know, how do we disrupt? How do we make, we make that disruption matter um, with, you know, the acknowledgement that you know there's still some things um, that we cannot necessarily uh, completely change. And Stephanie, you wanted to, oh, Lisa, yes. I just want to add really quickly, I know we're running out of time. I really think we need to separate this idea that not grading means um, lack of rigor. I mean, I'm all for rigor and the most and the sharpest uh, analytical thinking, but that doesn't mean I need to grade a student for that to happen. Agreed. Yeah. And Stephanie, you wanted to take Miriam's question. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly say about the assignments and, and how powerful just changing an assignment can be to giving a voice to someone who doesn't ordinarily feel like they have a chance to speak up in class. The, um, the change uh, of the final assignment from a paper to something else. Um, it, it, it's just huge. I, I made a switch to doing oral histories for the final project of um, all of my classes. And the students um, who feel like they don't want to talk to a stranger will interview a, a relative. And the students who um, you know, are more outgoing will go out and, and meet a stranger or someone that they, you know, a new acquaintance and they'll interview them. And generally in my classes, it's about, you know, some, a music experience. So it's really broad, but the, um, the result has been that, um, students who have traditionally been underrepresented in those final papers or who have really felt like they do not connect with the topic at all um, really bring in the most incredible projects because they're talking to people about things and they're hearing things they've never heard and it's it's been a phenomenal experience for the students that they've taken with them and wanted to pursue more oral history and that's a result of Joseph Enton's listening project and and the emphasis on oral history here at Brooklyn College so just that change in assignment has been incredible and it's and it's really low risk for them to have a conversation anybody else want to comment on that so I want to take a, just a minute to respond to Tony. And while I'm doing that, we have just enough time for everybody to have like a closing statement. If you want something, you know, to sort of cap off your presentation. Um, and so think about that while I'm, I'm responding to Tony. Um, Tony, great question. Have you found any resistance when implementing disruptive pedagogy in your classroom and how do you combat that resistance? I'm assuming you met from students. Um, and I think sometimes the answer is, is yes. There's some students um, who are very professionally minded, who are very grade motivated, who sometimes will question 
the, these approaches. And usually, I mean, what for me personally is what I do is I use my narrative methodology to explain to them what's happening and how they're not being deprived of grades or, you know, um, principles or whatever. So I, I sort of I sort of talk to them and allow them to see um, what is actually happening in the classroom. OK, so if we want to start giving our final statements um, in any order. Sure, I'll just say, you know, this kind of piggybacks off the question, the um, statement you made, Anna, in response to Tony, but I really feel that this, let the students do the work that they're going to learn. We don't, we don't have to grade them. We definitely should be rigorous. I agree with Lisa on that. And they have a lot to bring. You know, I used to come to my, that Simon, I just, this, that course I described with a reading list of peer reviewed journal articles, right? That were clinically relevant, but the students come up with their own and developmentally they're capable of doing that. I maybe wouldn't give that to, you know, first year students in an undergraduate seminar, but certainly for graduate students, they're capable of doing it. And I think it's great. It broadens their horizons. They learn to think in new ways. So yes, let's be, if it is disruptive, I don't even think of disruptive as disruptive. You know, it just makes sense. Maria? Um, I think that, uh, I think that there's a number of things that, you know, again, I think disruption and, and the, the, the stance to disrupt can be many, many, can be many things, right? Um, and that, you know, the choices have to do with the content that we bring, with the classes that we teach, with the, how we also teach about the process that we choose to, you know, to have in our classes and, and to teach in our classes. And for many of us, it's also about something also just showing up and, uh, you know, and speaking up, right? Particularly, uh, and allowing our students and creating a, uh, environments that are conducive for our students, particularly those with, uh, marginalized um, uh, identities, you know, for their voices to to be able to be heard and for them to be able to to um, you know uh, to speak, you know, and to bring you know uh, themselves into the class. Um, I think that that's also part of you know what what makes you know for you know a, a stimulating classroom, and that also is ultimately you know uh, disruptive in many ways. Lisa? Um, well, I guess I think it would be, it, it, it's wonderful for students to see their teachers learning and not as finished, completed learners, but as people who continue to learn and to, who continue to learn from students. Um, and I think that that's a really important um, aspect to bring to a disrupted classroom. And Stephanie? I was um, just thinking about the degree of vulnerability that we can show in the classroom and how important that is to our students because if we can be vulnerable and show them, you know, uh, as much of ourselves and uh, as possible and how much, you know, we have to, to learn and to, to show them um, as much of ourselves as possible, uh, then they might feel like they can show us a little bit of themselves and, um, and feel comfortable to learn in our presence. And that is such a privilege. Um, and to me, you know, disruption seems like a very basic way to stop something or to bring to an end something that's broken. And I think there's been a lot broken in education, both K through 12 and higher education. And I think people think of disrupting a particular kind of education is to actually um, break it. But I think disruption actually is a response to brokenness. And I think what you're disrupting is the brokenness itself um, in the hopes of making it better, All right? Does anybody else have any comments, questions? Um, are we out of time, technically? Unfortunately, we are out of time and the conversations will continue tomorrow. Thank you to all of our presenters so much for your thoughts. Thank you.
Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Take care. Good to see you.